once saved, always saved. If you get saved, you can't lose your salvation. And if you lost it, well, you were never really saved. That is the position of quite few Christians that they uphold, meaning as a Christian, you can never lose your salvation. And there's also another side that believes that if you commit any sins or if you don't confess them at the moment of your death, that you will go straight to hell. So I want to explore this topic further within this video. This video will be a little bit longer than usual. So take your Bible, take your notes and let's dive into this. I would like to quote John Wesley who said that once saved, always saved, tells us somewhat that no virgin's lamp can go out, Matthew 25 verse 8. No promising harvest can be choked with thorns, Matthew 13, 7. No branch in Christ could ever be cut off for not abiding, John chapter 15, verse 6. No forgiveness could ever be forfeited, Matthew 18, verse 32. No name can be blotted out of God's book of life, Revelation 3, 5 and Exodus 32, 33. No salt could ever lose its flavor, Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Once saved, always saved, also teaches that you cannot receive God's grace in vain. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. You cannot bury your talents. Matthew 25, verse 18. Neglect such a great salvation. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. Look back after putting your hand to the gospel plow. Luke chapter 9, verse 62. If you continue in His goodness, otherwise you will be cut off quoting Romans 11, 21 and 22. Nor deny the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Nobody or a body of believers could ever be so lukewarm that Jesus will spew them out of His mouth. Revelation chapter 3, verse 16. Once saved, always saved will argue that if you are lost, well, you were never found. John chapter 17, verse 12 where Jesus actually talks about Judas and he says, I lost one, the son of perdition. And then he quotes the scripture. Once saved, always saved argues that if you fall, well, that means you never stood. Romans chapter 11, verses 16 through 22, Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. It argues that if one was ever cast forth, meaning cast out, he was never in. And if one was ever withered, he was never attached to the vine and once green, John chapter 15. It also argues that if any man draws back, it proves that he never had anything to draw back from, Hebrews 10 verses 38 and 39. That if one falls away into spiritual darkness, that means he has never been enlightened or in the light in the first place, Hebrews chapter 6 verses 4 through 6. That if you once again got entangled in the pollutions of this world, that shows you never really escaped this world. 2 Peter chapter 2 verses 20. That if you put salvation away, well, you've never had it to put away in the first place. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 35. And if you had a shipwreck of faith, that means you never had a ship in the first place. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 19. Now that's mouthful. But these verses do explore the other side of the argument and you can't ignore these verses in the scripture. So here are a few takeaways that I have. One is that Christians don't lose their salvation like they lose their keys. We believe that true believers enjoy the assurance of our salvation. But we need to not be afraid to lose our salvation like a wallet dropping out of your pocket in a careless moment. Scripture assures us that God's provision and His sustaining power is the Holy Spirit. Accepting that the danger is real and that we can abandon our salvation does not mean that we live in continual fear of doing so. Forfeiting your salvation is like jumping out of the aeroplane. I like this illustration by Dr. Michael Brown and he says that a passenger on the plane is guaranteed to reach its destination unless you choose to do something crazy and open the emergency door and jump. Then you will arrive, well, at your death, not at your destination. But the possibility of losing your salvation, in other words, forfeiting your salvation is there. Now as Christians again we are assured of our salvation. John chapter 10 verse 27 it says, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. They shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. And the advocates of once saved, always saved will use this verse to say, huh? 
You see, it says anyone will ever snatch you out of my hand. But you must understand that this promise of eternal security is conditional. Have you noticed? It starts with my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. So this promise is conditional. Those who are given the promise of eternal life are those who follow and who hear. And Jesus also said that no one can snatch them out of his hand. He never indicated that we cannot put ourselves outside of Jesus' hand. The second truth that I want to highlight is that Christians don't lose their salvation by struggling with sin, but by practicing sin. There's a huge difference between struggling and practicing. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, it says, Not everyone who calls to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I want you to notice a few things is that these people confess the Lord but they didn't possess salvation. We also see they actually were used of the Lord but they were not yielded to the Lord. And how do we know that? Well, a few things. It says, I never knew you. And then it says, you practice lawlessness. So it's not that Jesus knew them and then he stopped knowing them. Now, people will argue and say, well, look, this proves that there is no such a thing as backsliding and apostasy. There's just, you either know Jesus or you don't. Because if you do know, you'll never backslide. And if you have backslid, that means you never knew him and he never knew you. But I want you to notice another thing in this verse. That it says, you who practice lawlessness. When a Christian struggles with sin, the Holy Spirit helps him. The church comes to his aid. But it's different when a Christian is practicing sin. You know, like when you're practicing, you're trying to get better at something. When you're struggling, that means there's a war going on. There's a wrestling match that's taking place. And so a person who is practicing, justifying, condoning their sin is not the same as the person who is struggling, trying to repent, de get delivered and get freed from their sin. Now in Luke chapter 12 verse 45 and 46, it says, The master of that servant will come on a day that he does not expect him and at the hour he is not aware of and he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. It's referring, if you look at verse 45, it's talking about a servant who was actually beating other servants who was in the house, who had an assignment by his master and who was habitually, intentionally and willfully doing things in opposition to master's will. And I want you to notice Jesus uses this parable and he highlights a conclusion to this parable by, by saying when he comes, when the Lord, the master comes, he says he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. So that indicates Jesus himself is highlighting that, that if we habitually, willfully, intentionally oppose the will of God, this is different than struggling. We will find ourselves in the same place as unbelievers. 2 Peter chapter 2 verses 20 through 21, it says the following, If you have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Again, Peter is warning believers who have escaped the corruption by knowing Jesus Christ and again choose to go back to the life of habitual, intentional and willful disobedience to Christ. This is not talking about a believer who fell back into the sin because if you remember what we escaped from, we escaped from living, practicing, willfully and intentionally sinning and we're going back to that lifestyle. It's not the act, it's the attitude that that believer has. And then he says, you're going to be worse than you were in the beginning. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 26 through 21. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sin is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment 
and raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot and who has treated as the unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? My friend, this is dealing with a believer who has been had the knowledge of truth, who has experienced God, who continually, deliberately, willfully and knowingly practices living in a sinful lifestyle, they place themselves in a very dangerous ground. Now when a Christian struggles with sin, when a Christian is battling with sin, repents and keeps falling back, this is not the same as justifying condoning and living in sin. When David fell into sin, the Bible says that he said, Lord, restore to me the joy of my salvation, Psalm 51, 12. He didn't say, Lord, restore to me salvation. Because as a Christian who struggles with sin, he may lose the joy of salvation, lose his reward, shorten his life, and even open door to the demonic. But we don't lose our salvation by struggling with sin because all of us are at constant war with the flesh and sin. But it's different when we begin to call what is wrong right, when we begin to call sin okay, when we begin to justify and live in that. I remember a young man who was delivered from homosexuality but he still struggled with homosexuality. We prayed with him, we walked with him, we discipled him, we didn't judge him because the desire of his heart, there was this natural desire toward righteousness and holiness. He wasn't straight, he didn't have desires for the opposite sex but he battled with the desires for the same sex. He served on our team for two years, genuinely pursuing God, loving God. But then there came a point where he actually went against the stance of the scripture and he said, God loves me the way he did and he accepts me the way I am and he says, I am born this way. So what happened to him? He went from struggling to practicing sin. He left the church soon after. He still believes in God, he still believes in Christ. He actually still believes everything is fine with him. He lives in deception now and he is a backslider. And people like that are the people that I'm referring to. Point number three, Christians can't lose their salvation but they can choose to forfeit their salvation by walking away from the Lord. Now I'm going to quote Charles Stanley who is one of the preachers and there's many preachers who teach that once you're saved you're always saved but I'm gonna quote this phrase and this quote from him. God does not require a constant attitude of faith in order to be saved. Only an act of faith in Christ. Believers who lose or abandon their faith will retain their salvation for God remains faithful even if a believer for all practical purposes becomes an unbeliever. His salvation is not in jeopardy. You can give it back only if the giver accepts the return. In the case of salvation, God has no has a strict no return policy. Now I respect Charles Stanley but I disagree with this statement because you can return something, the receiver doesn't have to receive it back, the person who gave it doesn't have to receive it back for you to lose it. And so the logic doesn't even work here and there's so many scriptures that conflict with that. So the idea that you can just pray one prayer when you were 16 and that's it, you just place your trust and then kind of do whatever you want, serve, worship the devil, go back into your old life and that one instance simply means that you are now forever saved. Like that's not what salvation is. Salvation is new life. Salvation is being in the family. Salvation is being a new creation. God is a cosmic lover. He's not a cosmic stalker. He doesn't force you to be with Him. Let's look at some verses in the Bible that I believe contradict this statement and the statement that a Christian cannot walk away from their faith or from God. Hebrews chapter 6 verses 6 through 6. It is impossible for those who have been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Spirit or the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the coming age if they fall away. 
to be brought back to repentance because to their loss they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting Him to public disgrace. It's actually saying it's impossible for an apostate to come back. Now it's not dealing with the backslider, it deals with an apostate. And who is this apostate? Now, a little background. The epistle of Hebrews was written to Jewish believers who have come to believe in Jesus as their Messiah. Many were under the pressure and persecution to return back to the synagogue and to the Judaism. Some actually have turned back from Christ to the law and to the legalistic fulfillment of the Moses' requirements. And this passage speaks directly to them. I mean, a few things I want to highlight is that once they were enlightened by the gospel, they tasted the heavenly gift of eternal life. They tasted the good word of God, the New Testament or New Covenant truths. They tasted the powers of the age to come. So the future kingdom age when Christ returns, they've been partakers of the Holy Spirit. They've been baptized in the Holy Ghost. But now they have fallen away. They've tripped up to return to Judaism by denying Jesus Christ. And they have fallen away by apostasy. And once that, once you lap into that apostasy, you actually, it's impossible to bring you back to repentance because people are so deceived and so stuck that it's not that God wouldn't accept them, it's just they are, they're disconnected and they are deceived. In 1 Timothy 4 1, it says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the later times, people will depart from the faith. So again, we see that people will depart from faith. Now, if you never had faith, you couldn't depart from it. So they would depart from faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. And that's what's happening today. How many people have you seen who were worship leaders, genuine worship leaders, people that we still sing their songs, who are either children of pastors, very known pastors, who deconstructed Christian faith, who walked away from faith, who renounced Christ. Do you think that they're still saved because they prayed a prayer at 16? They don't want to do nothing with Christ. They think Jesus is narrow-minded. Christians are weirdos. They departed from faith. It's possible. Otherwise, we wouldn't see these verses in the scripture that you prayed one time, you'll never be able to depart from your faith. It's like a trap. You know, you can't get out. It seems like people can because the Bible confirms it as well. Matthew 10, 22, it says, All men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. Meaning God says, you know, if you believe in me, but then you don't want to believe in me. God's like, I'm not going to hold you hostage. I'm not going to drag you to heaven if you don't want to be with me. Like, what kind of a love is that? People are like, oh, but God is faithful. He will do it for His glory. But what, forcing people to go to heaven who don't want to be with Him? Like, I don't know, where do you see that as love? To me, that's, that's a force. You get judged for that in the United States. And it's rape when you're forcing somebody to love you. God doesn't do that. He gives people a choice. That's why God always says, whoever believes, whoever, God gives you the choice. Matthew 24 verses 9 through 13, it says, Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and be put to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. And at that time, listen to this, many will turn away again from the faith and will betray and hate one another. Many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold and one who stands firm to the end will be saved. I want you to notice the difference between the love growing cold and people turning away from their faith. We're not talking about practicing habitually sinning. We're talking about people who turn their back on their faith. That is what causes a person to forfeit their salvation. Now let's go a little bit further. Colossians chapter 1 verses 21 through 23. Once you were annihilated from God, enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now He has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in His sight without blemish and free from accusation. If, let me say that again, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you have heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, 
have become a servant. Have you noticed Paul saying that? That now you come to Christ. And he says, if you continue in your faith, meaning if you stand true to the gospel, if you choose to walk away from the gospel and subject yourself to the laws of Moses and trying to earn salvation, it's possible to do that. The idea that a Christian cannot do that, like how would you explain these verses? People will say, oh, everyone who believes that a Christian can forfeit salvation is taking scripture out of context. How? Like how are these verses taken out of context? Like you don't have to impose your meaning on these verses. You just let these verses speak and you have to wrestle with that. For those of you who grew up teaching or learning or believing in this doctrine, like be honest, go to the Bible and wrestle with these verses until the scripture wins and your arguments and traditional upbringing loses. Romans chapter 11 verses 20 through 22. But they were broken off because of unbelief. But you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but be afraid. People say, oh, if you teach that a Christian can forfeit salvation, it brings fear. That's what Paul is trying to get us to have. Fear of God. Not fear of losing salvation. But to not have arrogance. I'll never lose my salvation. I can do whatever the heck I want. Paul is like, no. They were broken off because of unbelief. But you stand by faith. Don't be arrogant, but be afraid. For if God, if God did not spare the natural branches, He will not spare you either. Consider therefore the kindness and the sternness of God, the sternness to those who fell, but the kindness to you, provided that you continue have you noticed that? Continue in His kindness. Otherwise, what? You'll never lose your salvation. No, it says otherwise you will be also cut off. That's Paul in Romans. We're not done. Let's go to more verses. Hebrews chapter 3 verses 12 through 14. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end the confidence we had at first. It's speaking to brothers. It's not speaking to heathens. And it says that we have the ability to turn away from the living God. It says encourage each other daily so that we are not hardened because the struggle with sin could turn to something where we start actually justifying sin and our heart becomes so hardened that we become dead. We become blind and deceived. And we can actually walk away from that confidence that we had. 1 John chapter 2, verse 24. See what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you will also remain in the Son and in the Father. Have you noticed the if? Paul didn't say, well, you've heard things from the beginning don't be worried. He says, if it continues in you, you will remain. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verses 18 through 20. Timothy, my son, I give you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by following them you may fight the good fight, holding on to faith and a good conscience. Some have rejected these and have shipwrecked their faith. Among them are Hamanenias or whatever you pronounce his name and Alexander whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. Now it's interesting. He says hold on to faith. So we're dealing, first thing I mentioned is that habitual sin where a Christian is unrepentant when a Christian, Christian justifies their sin. But now we're dealing with walking away from Christ which the Bible again and again says Christians are able to do. And I'm not just bringing experiences of singers, preachers, pastors, kids. I'm talking about the Bible today. And we're not taking scripture of context. I'm letting you let the scripture define what it means to you. And it's very clear. Scripture is not confusing. You don't need to know all the Greek and all the Hebrew for it to give its meaning to you. Let's go to John chapter 15 verses 1 through 6. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Now some translation says he lifts off every branch that bears no fruit. But that's debatable. 
while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. And now this gets serious. He says, if a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, how is that possible? Like you're a branch. How can you choose? Like naturally, logic? Branches don't choose to break off the branch, right? That's why you can't always use logic to explain everything in the gospel. Because in here, logic doesn't work. Like Jesus, how is it possible? But he says somehow it is. And so he says, if anyone doesn't remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. What, is, what do you think it's talking about? It's not talking about our works being burned down as it talks about in Corinthians. This is talking about separating yourself from Christ. Galatians chapter 5 verse 4, you have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. What does the estranged mean? It means to be separated. It just simply means that those who try to be justified by good works have separated themselves and lost the benefits of Christ's grace. That's why he says you've fallen from grace. He's not dealing here with sin. He's dealing here with people walking away from their faith. James chapter 5 verses 19 through 20. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover multiple of sins. Again, this is talking about brethren. If anyone among you, meaning they belong to the family of believers, what does he do? Wander from truth. So we're not dealing here with the habitual sin. We're dealing with the person who no longer believes the gospel. And he says, if you go and actually return him. So this person has not went to the place where it's impossible to return him. Meaning this person has backslid. They didn't have, they haven't become the apostate yet. They have backslid. And he says that if anybody among you guys actually goes and bring him back, bring this unfaithful Christian back to God, then you're turning this Christian who at one point was good, now he became lost, you're saving his soul from death. Now of course James is not referring from physical death because this guy hasn't died. He's talking about spiritual death. Now how can you save another Christian's soul from death if once saved is always saved? You couldn't do that. So now I want to address few logics that people use concerning once saved, always saved. Because sometimes, you know, and I read the teachings and I respect, there's a lot of teachers and preachers that I, I genuinely respect. Some of them are my close friends that, and sometimes I watch their videos or listen to their blogs and, you know, and I hear the logic and I was like, man, I like the logic. I like that approach. But as we looked with the branch, you can't apply logic to everything. There are things in the scripture that honestly your logic won't work, like the Trinity, like other things that you just have to take the scripture and let the scripture speak to you, not your logic. Now, the first logic that I heard is that if you lost your salvation, you never had it. And actually this one has a scripture verse for that. First John chapter 2 verses 19. Now I will start with the verse 18. Why? Because this is how it's usually presented. Well, 1 John chapter 2, verse 19, it says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. If they had been of us, they, have been, they would have, have continued with us, but they went out so that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. Now, at first, when you read it, you're like, yeah, that means if they left us, they were never really born again. But you have to read the verse before. And the verse before, verse 18, says the following, Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that that is the last hour. They, who they? Antichrists, went out from us. 
So we're not talking about backsliders. We're talking about apostates. We're talking about antichrist. So you can't take that and stick it to a Christian walking away from their faith because it's dealing with antichrists, not backsliders. The second logic that I hear a lot of times that if you lose your salvation, that means you had to earn it because you got it by grace. Now you have to keep it by works. That is the furthest thing from the truth. We see that in verses, for example, Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 20, it says, again, when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, I lay a stumbling block before him and he shall die. Because you did not give a warning, he shall die in his sin and his righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered by his blood but his blood I will require of your hand. Now this is an Old Testament uh, scripture but it does have a very similar principle. Righteous man turns from his righteousness meaning he forfeits, he walks away and then he starts of course committing iniquities but God's like even then I'm going to try to bring him back. I'm going to send stumbling blocks and I'm going to send some preachers in his life. We don't keep our salvation by good works but we remain with God. We remain in faith. The whole idea of forfeiting your salvation is you are turning away from your faith. You received salvation through faith by grace and you have to stay in that grace. It's more accurate to say that it's the grace that keeps us but the grace doesn't have a grip on us that you can't get away from. God's grace is not a Colombian cartel. You get in and you can't get out. God doesn't trap people like some abusers in the basement and chain them up and don't let them get out. You heard those stories where somebody is obsessed with somebody and they lock them, they feed them and they simply say, you're better here with me. That's not what God does. God gives you a choice. Even when angels wanted to rebel. God didn't trap them in heaven. He kicked them out. When Adam and Eve rebelled, God didn't trap them in the garden. He kicked them out. When Israel rebelled, even though He had a covenant with them, He drove them out of their land and divorced them until they repented. Why? Because God is just and God will honor your will. It has nothing to do with earning our salvation by trying to keep our salvation. It's us being in Christ and Jesus keeping us in Him. Now the third logic that I heard is that you can't be unborn. Once you're born again, you can't be unborn. Once you're redeemed, you can't be unredeemed. Once you're forgiven, God cannot go back and like unforgive you. Well, you remember about the parable of a king forgiving an enormous amount of debt and then he went and unforgave him, the servant who refused to forgive his servant with a smaller debt and Jesus says the same way the Father will do it. So you can't use that. I know the logic doesn't fit here. There has been many beings who've been once children of God who are now outside of the family of God. I mentioned angels. I've mentioned Lucifer. I mentioned you know Judas who was a part of Jesus's inner circle who ended up betraying him. Believer can backslide. A coin can get lost. A sheep can stray. A son can leave the father's house. A backslider is on a dangerous ground and needs to be challenged to repentance lest his backsliding leads to apostasy. Logic number four that I heard is that our salvation is eternal. If you lose it or forfeit it, then it's not eternal. It's only until you forfeit it. But nowhere in the Bible does it say that when you receive salvation, that you lose your freedom to choose. The Bible uses the example of family and marriage. Can children disown their parents? Of course. Can children leave their parents, block them? Now, do they still remain children? Yeah. Children who will carry their last name, who might carry their DNA, but they're no longer a part of that family. At least they don't want to be a part of that family. Can spouses divorce? Can a spouse leave another spouse and be with somebody else? Yes, they can. Marriage is a covenant but it's also not a trap. You have the freedom to do what you want. You don't lose that freedom when you join Jesus. When you become saved, the salvation is eternal. God is promising to keep you in His hand. He says, nothing will separate you from me. 
But I do give you a choice. If you want to leave, the door is always open. Some people say, well, this ideologic number five, if you preach it, it's going to scare people. It's going to bring them fear. Well, Paul said that's what it's supposed to do. Um, but Christians are not driven by fear. They're driven by love. But still, Christians are driven by the fear of God. We live in the awe of God, not in the fear of losing our salvation. But it does produce motivation toward holiness. But people who embrace once saved, always saved. A lot of people take it to that extreme where they do whatever they want and they simply don't live a life of pleasing God. And so fear is a healthy thing. Fear that paralyzes you, a fear that makes you doubt God, that's not a healthy fear. But you don't need to embrace the truth of God to live in that fear because that fear, the source of it is demons, not the Word of God. And lastly, the sixth logic is, well, if you believe that you can lose your salvation, that simply means that you can lose your salvation anytime you sin and then you get repented, then you get your salvation back and then you need to get baptized again. It's like this cycle. Like you, you lose your salvation in the morning, you get it back in the evening. You lose your salvation again because you committed some sin, you get it back. But this logic is flawed because the Bible doesn't teach us that. We know that as Christians we walk in the light and the blood of Jesus washes us from all of our sins. It doesn't say that when the blood washes us we have to get born again and born again. But if we walk away from the Lord, if we forfeit Him, that's a different story. For example, let's say that in my marriage I have made a mistake and I make mistakes, a lot of them, okay. I repent a lot to my wife but there's a difference between me saying I do at the wedding and me saying I am sorry. One is the confession of my covenant. The other one is the confession of my wrongdoings. One is I do. The other one is I am sorry. Now I've been married for 12 years. Do you know how many times I said I do? Twice. Now first time I said it was 12 years ago and then second time I said it wasn't because we were getting remarried. I was just honestly re um, 10 year anniversary. So we decided to say our vows again. This wasn't to reinstate our marriage. It was honestly to renew our covenant. But you know how many times I have said I am sorry? I don't know the count. I say I'm sorry all the time because the keys to a healthy marriage is you're wrong <laughs> and the faster you admit it, the happier you will be and the closer you will grow to your spouse and to God. So one, I do gives me a covenant and I am sorry keeps me close, okay? And that is really how we repent of sins. So when I do something that is not pleasing to God, I don't get saved again. I get sanctified by my confession. Jesus says, I'm going to wash your feet disciples because you're already clean. So that speaks of cleansing. That speaks of sanctification. It's not speaks of salvation. It speaks of growing in Christ through repentance. Now when the person habitually sins, they walk away from the fellowship, they walk away from the Lord, they forfeit their faith, okay? They're not just coming back and saying, Lord, I'm sorry. It's like a spouse that cheated on their spouse, left the marriage, went to live with somebody else. When they come back, they don't say, hey, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry, I was gone for the last three years. I've been uh, sleeping around and uh, yeah, I'm moving in. No, that's not, this is going to take a lot more than I'm sorry. This is going to take, you're going to have to restart this whole thing because this covenant died. Trust died. It's like prodigal son coming back. You know, there's that brokenness. Now our father, of course, he will embrace us. He will love us. If he will see the repentance, he will take us in, give us the garments and give us all the, God will restore a repentant sinner. So I hope this will clarify for you that just because I believe that a Christian can forfeit salvation and can habitually sin and lose their salvation by habitually staying in sin, this doesn't mean that, that when I fall into sin that that I lose salvation and I need to get saved again. Righteous falls seven times and he rises back up. It's just a completely different world view. And people who accuse myself or so many other preachers in the world or ministers who uphold this view that I believe is scriptural. 
um, will use that argument against this view and say that, oh, it's just simply you guys go from losing salvation and getting salvation back. But again, it's not like losing your keys or losing your wallet. Now, so to finish everything, a true believer, I believe, the scriptures I presented to you, they're undeniable. They can choose to apostatize. They can backslide. They can reject God's grace and they can forfeit salvation. Although we are secure in Jesus, if we ultimately reject Him, we forfeit that security. That is our stance. I want to hear your response to that. If you can be kind, we can disagree. But I want you to bring some scriptures, some verification to your view if it's different below in this video. If this video was a blessing to you, hey, share this with other people. I know it's controversial, but sometimes we have to talk about those topics. If you enjoyed this content, hey, give me thumbs up to this video and subscribe to this channel and click on the bell so you can be reminded each time we upload new content. If this ministry is a blessing to you, consider becoming a partner so that we can release more content as such. We brought more people on our team so that we can produce high quality content, so we can produce material to disciple nations through digital content.